being rich. Well, let's look at the Greek word. It is the word plusios. And the definition now means wealthy. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, it means abounding, abounding in material resources, money, possessions, containing a large amount. And that's still kind of vague. So to bring it home, it means having more than you need. Did you know that the majority of the world's population, I don't know if you're aware of this, because we live here in the United States of America, and this nation is blessed beyond my ability to say so. But most of the population of the world will work all day tomorrow just to get enough food for that day. Are you aware of that? Most of the world's population will work all day tomorrow. They'll either be out trying to hunt the food, catch the food, find the food, work for the food, um, just to get enough for the family to eat tomorrow. How incredible is that? Okay, so, but it's having more than needed. So, uh, according to this definition, someone who has more than they need would be considered plusios. Um, a few lead-in thoughts. Uh, being rich is the gift of God. To the believer, okay? And listen, just listen to the Bible verse. I'll read it. Main thing is you listen. And, um, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God... For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Here's another Bible verse. Both riches and honor come of thee. Now that is 1 Chronicles 29 verse 12. And that might be the one you're looking at. Both riches and honor come come of thee. Okay? And then this Bible verse, every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. Wow. Now, however, um, there are some perils of being rich or dangers. There are some dangers that are attached to, I, I, maybe the better word would be risks, some risks that come with being rich. Now listen, uh, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God. Remember, he's the one that, he's the one that gives riches.
A faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. <clears throat> means cutting corners, taking shortcuts. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's one of the risks of being rich. It's very hard for rich people to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that is because um, they have their trust in their riches instead of in Jesus. There's one problem with that. The Bible says um, God doesn't accept money um, as uh, a way to get to heaven. So that's, that's a serious problem. <laughs> um, here's another risk of being rich. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And then there are some temptations that come with being rich. Temptations, and they're powerful temptations. Listen to this verse. But they that will be rich shall fall into temptation and a snare. Snare means a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, meaning sinful desires, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So, um, and then riches are uncertain and they are uh, they, they're fleeting. You know, you heard the saying, here today, gone tomorrow. Well, listen to this verse. <clears throat> Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation? So, and then finally, um, this is from Solomon, remember? We looked at Solomon's life, I think it was Sunday evening. And Solomon said, Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. <laughs> so Solomon said, I either worked all my life and I'm gonna and I'm gonna leave everything I earned from working, someone else is going to get it. <laughs> what an interesting thought. Those are some lead in thoughts about uh, riches. About so well, let's let's uh, let's do this. Let's go to uh, Job chapter Job chapter one. So, right before uh, Psalms. So we're going to look at a couple of rich men. So we're going to look at three rich men. Okay. So, but. Now, wow. in uh, Job chapter 1, I we'll want you to look at verses 1, 2, and 3 of Job chapter 1. Uh, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright 
and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest, which is another word for richest, of all the men of the East. Now, just the livestock alone, um, I researched this, and I found today's market value for the livestock that are mentioned, just the livestock, not counting his silver, his gold, his, uh, his land holdings, that, none of that, just the livestock. Does anybody want to venture a guess at the dollar value of his livestock? You can, you can take another look if you want, you, but I've got the total at today's market value. You guys want to take a guess? You say 10 million? That's a good guess. That's a real good guess. All right. Anybody else want to take a guess? Say what? Eight million. Eight million. Now there are no prize for you know for being the closest. So I want I want to ease the tension in the room right now. Okay. And and anybody else? Mrs. Ellis? Give us something, please. <laughs> okay. Well, hold on to your seats. Just the market value, today's market value of the listed livestock, $56 million. And that, that doesn't count anything else. That's just the livestock. You know, I think that would be considered a big spread even down in the Lone Star State, I think. <laughs> so, um, and, and here's what we know from God about Job. Um, we know that Job was saved. We know that Job respected God above all others even above himself. We know that Job was honest, and we know that Job was moral. He had a strong moral Bible compass for his life. So, and those, those words, you know, in verse 1, that, that's what God is telling us about Job. So, um, he's definitely... Um, He's definitely um, in tune with God. There's another rich man. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13. We'll see if we can find out about another rich man. And uh, so we'll do that in, in Genesis chapter 13. I forgot to ask, you know, I was going to ask how many, how many, how many want to be rich? Well, I, um, and, uh, but, you know, from the definition, if you have more than you need, you're considered rich. And if you have more than you need for any given day, <laughs> how about that? Um, Genesis 13 and verse number 2. And Abram, so there's, there's our next uh, rich man. Abram was well, not just rich, he was what class? He was very rich. And, and God tells us where his wealth was found, in cattle which would be like Job, in silver and in gold. Okay. 
And uh, Brother Cecil, are you still looking for that gold? You still looking for that gold? Okay. Um, drop down to verse number five. We'll read five and six. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land, now watch this, the land was not able to bear them. The, the land, there was not a, enough resource on the land to sustain. Abram and Lot's flocks and herds that they might dwell together for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. They, they, had, they had these huge um, ginormous flocks and herds and um, there wasn't enough grass to feed them all. And so drop down then to verse 14 and I'll read through verse 18. So they separated and uh, you may recall the story Lot, does anybody recall where Lot went and pitched his tent? Where did Lot go? By the gate of the gate of Sodom, yeah. And so once Lot left, and wow, did he ever get in trouble? Um, but verse fourteen, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward in all directions, which by the way, the location of, uh, of this place today we call, we call Israel, the promised land, is where this event occurred. Verse 15, for for how much of the land? For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. Israel is not an occupier, they are an owner. Okay? And to thy seed, for how long? Forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. God gave Abram and his descendants, Israel, and this, this is the promised land. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there and built there a what unto the Lord? And what does that tell us? He built there an altar unto the Lord because Abram did what? An altar is for the purpose of worshiping God. So what that tells us is Abram was in a relationship with God. Now, chapter 15 of Genesis chapter 15, and here we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Okay. Um, And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And, and you know, it's, did you catch that? 
Um, Abram had was very rich, but that's not the big deal. The big deal is is that the Lord was Abram's reward. That's the big deal. Abram was a child of God, and God was his reward. That's the big deal, is that relationship with God, knowing God, that's what counts. And Abram said in verse number two, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Um, let's see if I'm in 15, yeah. Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus, Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir, mine heir. And um, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And that's a reference to uh, Messiah, to Jesus, who would come through the lineage of Abram. Anyway, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So, verse 6, that's what I want you to see. So God made Abram a promise about Jesus, about the Savior. And what is Abram's response to God's promise to him about Jesus, about the Savior? Verse 6, and he did what, class? He believed in the Lord. And he, that is, the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. So Abram became right with God by believing in Jesus. It's the same way we become right with God even today. Okay. So we've established that he knew the Lord, he was a child of God, he was very rich. Now, um, you'll have to get the rest from Hebrews chapter 7, so please join me there about Abraham, or Abram, one and the same. So Hebrews chapter 7 Now in Hebrews chapter 7, so we're, we're going to look at uh, <clears throat> verses 1 through 4. For this Melchizedek, the name of, of, the, of the high priest, of, of the priest, um, king of Salem, that's Jerusalem, the king of the city of peace, uh, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Because remember, the kings uh, kidnapped Lot, took captive Lot, and Abraham had to go rescue his nephew Lot. <clears throat> that was only the beginning of Lot's problems. Um, and uh, so Abraham rescued Lot, rescued all of their property, all of their valuables, all of their possessions. And uh, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. 
verse number two, to whom also Abraham gave a what? A tenth part of all. First, being by interpretation. So now we, we have to find out who Melchizedek is. And verse 2 helps us uh, with that. First, being by interpretation, king of, king of what, class? King of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of, Peace. And then um, verse 3 will help us more with the identity of Melchizedek. Who is he? Without father, without mother, without descent, as it concerns the normal process of mankind. But there's more. Having neither beginning of days... What does that mean? It means that Melchizedek had no birth date. Now you, you and I, we all have a birthday, not Melchizedek. Now how can that be? How can it be that he has no birth date, no birthday? The only one who has no birthday is the one who has always been. And who is that? It's God. So, um, nor end of life, who has no end of life, no, no birthday, no, 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 no date of death, it's God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He's always been. Um, but made like unto the Son of God. Well, that's getting very specific about Melchizedek. Abideth a priest continually. Jesus is our priest. The priest represents us to God. Now consider, verse 4, how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave what? The tenth of the spoil. So, Every time God increased Abraham, Abraham gave God a tenth of whatever the increase was. Now, so what I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that is, is that if you tithe, you'll be rich. Um, or you'll get richer. Um, I know professing, I know people who profess to know Jesus, and, and I think they do, and they do not tithe. And they're very, they're very rich. Okay. I know Christians who do know Jesus, and they do tithe. And And they're blessed, and they're blessed. And so, tithing is laying up in store, laying up and laying treasure up in heaven. Um, it's thinking beyond the now. It's thinking beyond this life into our heavenly abode. It's laying up in store. And, and there are some who profess to know Jesus, they're not laying up in store. They're just not. But there are uh, believers, Christians, who are laying up in store by tithing. Okay. Now, um, and, I, and I think 
That's the difference. Some are laying up and some are not. Now, um, let's, let's do this. Let's go to the last book of the Bible, which is Mal- uh, sorry, uh, of the Old Testament. So let's go back to Malachi because uh, God gets very detailed about what Abraham did by way of tithing in Malachi chapter number three. So we'll look at that, Malachi chapter three. Um, Abraham tithed before the Mosaic law. Abraham was tithing 400 years before um, the Ten Commandments. Abraham was tithing under grace. Tithing occurred during the uh, Mosaic Law. Tithing, obviously, um, is mentioned in the New Testament. But now notice this in Malachi chapter 3, and we want to, let's, I think, want to look at uh, verse 7 and on, Malachi 3 verse 7. So God is speaking, even from the days of your fathers are ye gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. And so God is dealing with the disobedience of his people. And God says, return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? <clears throat> you know, when you think of the word robbery or rob, if somebody's been robbed, what happened to that person? They lost, they lost something, they lost some of their property. Would it be they lost some of their property? So, God is speaking in terms of his property, of what belongs to him. So, well, then that begs the question, all right, Lord, what, what, have you, what are you being robbed of, Lord, God? And so they ask him, they, they ask him in verse 8, wherein have we robbed thee? And look what God answers. <laughs> in tithes and Offerings. So we know that Abraham did not rob God because he, he tithed. He returned to God, God's property. And, and in doing so, he was laying up in store against the time that he would be in heaven. And uh, so, um, but now watch this. Verse 9, so God says, to his people that are robbing him, he says, ye are cursed with a curse. And why? For ye have robbed me. Even this, how, how prolific was it? How, 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 you know, widespread was this robbery? He says, the whole nation, all of Israel. And then he, in verse 10, he says, God says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse <clears throat> that there may be meat in mine house that is provision for God's work and prove me the word prove means test me now herewith herewith means by you know returning my tithe to me saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a what, class? A blessing. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. And if that were not enough, look at verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he, referencing the devil, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, 
neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So there is a promised blessing clearly by God to those who return God's property to him the way Abraham did. And uh, Abraham will not only be blessed upon the earth, but he will be blessed because he laid up in store in heaven. And some are not laying up in store, and some are. Abraham did, and uh, clearly he was blessed on earth and um, in, in a wonderful way. So Abraham believed and showed God he trusted in him, trusted him by returning to God his tithe whenever God increased him in wealth. Now who else gives riches? Let's go to the let's go to the uh, go to Luke chapter four. We've got to wind this up here. It's that time again, Luke chapter four. So we know that God gives riches, but who else gives riches? Who else can give riches? <clears throat> and so uh, Luke chapter four, verse five through eight. And the devil taketh him, that's Jesus, up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Wow. So this is a supernatural event. And the devil said unto him, <clears throat> All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and, and to whomsoever I will, I do what, class? Yeah. Yep. So, would you look at that? He says, I give it. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Psalm 13, verse 7. I'm sorry, what did I do here? Verse, oh, Proverbs. <laughs> yeah, that would help. Proverbs. Proverbs 13, verse 7. Proverbs 13, verse 7. Now look at this. Um, there is that maketh himself rich, and hath what, class? How does that work? <laughs> there is that maketh himself rich, and hath nothing, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Boy, there's food for thought. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 16. Because this is the third rich man that we want to look at tonight in Luke chapter 16. And so we'll begin in verse 19 of Luke chapter 16. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen um, fared and fared sumptuously every day. Now what would be one of the highest priced eateries in this city? Can anybody give me some idea? What would be a very costly place to eat out in this city? Anybody I mean, is that the name of a place to eat? <laughs> well, we had years ago, and this was probably, I don't know what, 25 years ago, friends come down 
and they went up the, is it the stratosphere? And they went round and round while they ate their dinner uh, up in the stratosphere. And, uh, and it, it, what did it cost them? Like, it was like $300. But that's like 25 years ago. I don't know what it would be now. You know. <laughs> um, my point is, here's a man who could do that every day every day fared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table moreover the dogs came and licked his sores what a sight and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Well, there's Abraham, the, one of the rich men. The rich man also died and was buried. Now watch this, verse 23. So the rich man also died and was buried and in where, class? Now here's a man who had everything. He had everything. He fared sumptuously every day. You know, despite the fact that he was a rich man here upon the earth, where did he wake up? In hell. In hell. So, he was rich. He was very rich because he fared sumptuously every day. <laughs> every day was special for the rich man, but that's just the way he lived. But despite his riches, where did he wake up? So what does that tell us about riches? If he was rich and he died and woke up in hell, his riches could not do what for him? could not buy his way out of hell or his way into heaven. Okay? I mean, look at that. Um, and he cried and, uh, and said, now what's he, gonna, what's he crying about in verse 24? And he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus Lazarus, remember, who is Lazarus? What did Lazarus have? He had nothing. But, so what did we read? There are people who have nothing and yet have, have everything. There are people who have everything and yet have nothing. So here's a man who had everything and ended up with nothing. And here's another man who had nothing and ended up with everything. Um, and he, you know, he said, send Lazarus, verse 24, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. When the Bible says he has nothing, the Bible means he has nothing. He doesn't even have a drop of water that he can call his own. He has nothing. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now, I'm asking you, is Lazarus a believer? How do you know he's a believer? Because he's He's, he's in paradise. He, he's with Abraham. And remember, Abraham believed, and God counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham's a believer. Lazarus is a believer. But here's the point I'm making. Lazarus is in heaven. You know, somebody says, well, if you tithe, then, you know, everything's always going to be 
easy street. Everything's always going to be good. Everything's always going to be nice. Everything's always going to be great. Wait a minute. What is the description of Lazarus' life? He, he was laid at a gate, the dogs licking his oozing sores. And, he, and, and what did he want? He wanted crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. <laughs> you know, so... Food for thought. There's a lot to think about here. And uh, so he goes on in verse number 26, and, and beside all this, between us and you, Abraham says to the rich man who was in hell, there's a great gulf fixed, this vast expanse of distance, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, we cannot come from paradise to you where you are in the burning hell. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So once you're there, you're staying put. There's no going back and forth from place to place. Wow. So Two people, one had nothing and now has everything. The other had everything and now has nothing. What is the decisive factor? What is the decisive factor? It, it's not things, it's not money, it's having who, class? Jesus, Jesus. And Now, um, okay. So, um, do you have Jesus? Do you have Jesus? No amount of money will buy any lost soul away into heaven. And no amount of money will buy any lost soul a way out of hell. Do you have Jesus? That is the decisive factor. Um, three rich men, three rich men, and um, two of them with you, Lord, one of them in hell. But all rich. You give riches. Riches are a gift from God, your word plainly states. But the devil gives riches to those who will worship him, to those who will embrace him, believe in him. The devil gives riches. But what's at the end of it all? Two of those men believed in you, Lord Jesus, and they're with you now and will be forevermore. One of those rich men got his riches by worshiping Satan, and he will forever be in hell and the lake of fire. Father, um, so thankful that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by, but by me, by Jesus. And I'm especially, Lord, praying for any person that does not know Jesus, has never believed in Jesus, never invited Jesus to come into their life. Would you draw them right now, Father, wherever they are. Just bring them to Jesus. And if God is speaking to your heart right now and saying to you that he wants you to accept Jesus, then why don't you pray wherever you are 
whoever you are, why don't you pray right now, dear Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Please forgive me of all of my sins against God. Please save me from hell. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless our prayer time. We ask it in Jesus' name.